This is Stand Up For The Truth, addressing important issues and topics affecting Christians across the nation. Good morning, I'm Crash Connell. It is a fresh new podcast today. The date on the calendar is Friday, February 23, 2024. Got a new guest today. Uh, what, what, uh, you said February. It is February. Oh, okay. No, August 23, <laughs> 2024. <laughs> okay. Did I really say February? Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. I, well, I was just thinking today's guest, first time guest, is going to be easy to remember if you ever shaved, if you ever had a Bic pen or a Bic lighter. I believe they, I, I'm just, yeah. I could be wrong because I said February, yeah. so I was wrong well, there. <laughs> I kind of wish it was this temperature in February, that'd be a happy it's, thing. Uh, that's maybe what I do yeah, that, right. so anyway, okay, let me do it again. Friday, August 23, 2024, it is. and thank you for correcting me. Yes. Well, good morning, it's my pleasure to welcome Britt Gillette to the program for the first time today, and I'm looking forward to his insights into Bible prophecy, especially we're going to talk about the global economy today. I learned a lot studying for this, and uh, I trust it'll be informative to the listener as well. But first, my scripture is Psalm 63, 1 to 5. I love these verses. O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Let's pray. Lord, your grace is sufficient for anything that we might face today, Lord. Help us to draw near to you and seek you diligently as we see the day approaching. We lift up those, Lord, who are hurting, maybe going through difficult seasons of trial or grief. Lord, we ask that you would comfort them as only you can. We lift up our nation in unstable times. We know that you have all things in hand, so help us not to fear or doubt. But we do pray for our leaders that we can continue to have space and time to communicate your great provision of salvation to a lost and dying world. We lift up Brit to you for the things you've given him to put his heart into and his mind to, for continued open doors, for provision in all things, and protection for him and his loved ones, Lord, for good health. And um, Lord, whatever they, whatever they need, thank you for providing for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, author, apologist, prophecy student, teacher, Britt Gillette is a keen observer of the times. He is the founder of End Times Bible Prophecy, a ministry dedicated to helping people learn more about the amazing prophecies found in the Bible. This ministry is focused on proclaiming two messages. The Messiah is Jesus, Acts 5.42, and Jesus is coming soon, Revelation 22.20. He's the author of Coming to Jesus, One Man's Search for Truth and Life Purpose, Signs of the Second Coming, 11 Reasons Jesus Will Return in Our Lifetime, Racing Toward Armageddon, Why Advanced Technology Signals the End Times, and The End Times, A Guide to Bible Prophecy and the Last Days. He is also a regular contributor to RaptureReady.com, which is where I initially started to see his articles. Website, www.endtimesbibleprophecy.com with hyphens between each word, endtimesbibleprophecy.com. And that link will be in the podcast post today. Also, brittgillette.substack.com, another uh, link that will be in the post today. Britt, welcome to Stand Up For The Truth. Thanks for having me, Mary. It's great to be here. Um, what? Uh, tell us a little bit about the ministry. How long have you been doing this? And, and just, uh, uh, I think you are recommending the Substack uh, site Primarily, right? I know a lot of other people I talk yes. to are moving over to Substack. So that is the that is the main place that'll have your articles. Yes, that's the the central hub where people okay. can find me and connect with me. I'll, I'll post notes there on okay. things that I'm reading, articles, videos that I'm paying attention to. I'll post uh, the latest articles I write, uh, the latest videos I put out, and people can sign up to receive those by email for free. Great. So. Great. Uh, Brittgillette.substack.com. That's pretty much where I'm, my home is yeah. on the internet. <laughs> yeah. It's becoming a, a really common place. And there's a, there are a lot of great people on Substack. I'm, I'm finding people I wouldn't maybe normally have found without Substack. You know, you can't really do a search for a lot of good authors, but you can find them all there. So I do enjoy that. How long have you been, um, when did you start your ministry? 
Well, really, I started writing online and probably posting to Rapture Ready back in mm. early 2007. Okay. So, and this is, I've got a full time job that's totally unrelated to this. So, this ah. is just what I do in my spare time. Mm -hmm. And uh, those articles, I, I would put those out monthly for years. And then, as of a few years ago, a couple of years ago, I just couldn't keep up with the news anymore. <laughs> got to oh. a point where I thought, well, which of the 19 things do I write about this month? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so I figured, well, I'll just, I'll start making videos and I'll just stand in front of the camera. Then I, I, I can do that quicker than I can write. Mm -hmm. And then that led to videos. And that's what I do three of those a week now. So Great. Uh, that's enabled me to cover a lot more of what's happening. And even then I still can't keep up with yeah. all of it. No, it's impossible. It's impossible. And I thought it was impossible 10 years ago. Well, this is this is crazier. But, sure. um, you know, it's been a while uh, since we took a good look here on stand up at the economic state, not only of this nation, but the interconnected economies of the whole world. Um, so this is very timely. And I, Britt, I wonder how the economy has held together this long, except for a lot of propping and finagling. Do you ask yourself that question sometimes? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's boggled my mind for many years as to how this has continued on. I like to describe the, the global financial system as a Ponzi scheme <laughs> built on a house of cards mm. constructed on a foundation of lies. Mm. And I, I'm not sure how it has held up as long as it has yeah. and how they've been able to keep it from collapsing for as long as they have. Yeah. Yeah. Some people have, have said, and I don't dispute that this may be the case, that it's God holding it back. Yeah. And the rapture may be mm -hmm. the spark that unleashes all of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know yeah. if that's the case or not, but mm -hmm. I believe we're at a point now where they can no longer kick the can down the road mm -hmm. and prolong the inevitable collapse. I mm -hmm. believe we're in the early part of the unraveling right now. The beginning of the end. Yeah, and I agree with that. There, there is a restraining force. Just looking at Israel, of course, um, how that has held together this long. Um, and the flood, the tide of immorality in the world and everything, and God's timing is perfect. And so I do tend to think of this also in terms of the restraining force of the Holy Spirit. Um, and like you said, we can't know that definitively, but I think that there's something to stand on there. I want to go back to August the 5th, uh, and I want to walk this forward. Uh, because on that day, the Asian markets tanked. In fact, uh, global stock markets plummeted, led by sharp declines in Asia. And uh, on, a, on August 6th, it was crickets. We didn't hear anything on August the 6th. Uh, the sell-off, though, was partly due to the Bank of Japan's interest rate hike a couple days prior. But it was the biggest two-day drop in Japanese stock market history. And the U.S. market went kind of weak in the knees, too. Crypto took a big hit. Uh, Iran was threatening to blow up the Middle East. All of the kinds of things you want to wake up to on a Monday morning. Uh, but the reason for the market jitters was given, Britt, there is a rumor that the U.S. is in a recession. Just a rumor. That doesn't give me much confidence that anything isn't built on sand, right? Um, it, was this a stress test? I don't know. Now, Japan, they tell us, has recovered these losses. But there's more to it, of course. And I think the system is on life support. Uh, and globalists, of course, have something waiting in the wings, uh, which we are going to get to. But what are your initial thoughts on August 5th? Because, like I said, no one's talking about it anymore. Um, and you wrote an article in May, Six Potential Triggers for the Next Global Financial Crisis. And you talk about Japan. They're the world's fourth largest economy. Um, their prime minister has just uh, resigned recently, effective in September. So what's going on over there that maybe we don't even know about? Well, what's taking place in Japan right now is a currency crisis, and there's no way out of it, mm. which is why we're in the early moments of this unraveling. It's just a ma it's not a matter of if it happens, it's a matter of when and how quickly uh, we go through the steps that get us from where we are now to the new system that's coming. And so the primary reason we saw the, the market crash three weeks ago was the unraveling of something called the yen carry trade. Mm. So to put that in simplistic terms, Japan, the Bank of Japan has manipulated the free market for many decades. They've suppressed interest rates artificially in order to avoid uh, high interest payments on Japanese government debt, which is, mm. we, we think our debt is high, and it is at 35 trillion in the United States. 
but that's around 120% of GDP. Yes, that's bad, but in, yeah. in Japan, it's 264%. So they're more than twice as worse wow. than wow. the United States. So the Bank of Japan has artificially suppressed interest rates so that the interest on that national debt doesn't bankrupt uh, the Japanese government. And mm. they've gone out and they've bought up more than half of all the Japanese government debt. They simply print yen, they go out and buy it, they try to wow. suppress the interest rates. Well, in doing that, that's created the foundation for a systemic financial crisis all over the globe. Because when you think of traditional banking, how do you tra traditionally, how do banks? make a profit while well, they loan money out at one rate that's higher than the rate that they pay their depositors and then they pocket the mm -hmm. difference called mm -hmm. the spread and so what what do you do when your interest rates are at zero percent or pretty close oh. to zero percent which is what they've been in japan mm -hmm. for many years at one time they were negative and I find wow. that hard to even wrap my mind around that you could have negative interest <laughs> yeah. rates. But this manipulation of the free market has led to a place where Japanese banks, as well as financial entities all over the world, have borrowed Japanese yen at those low interest rates. Maybe you, you borrow it. 0.1%. That's a pretty good rate. Most of us here in, mm -hmm. in the United States would like to borrow money at that yeah. rate. And then they go out and they uh, buy things like U.S. Treasuries that pay a 5% yield or corporate debt that pays 8 or 9%. And then they pocket the difference. And then to make it even better, they might take, let's say you had a million dollars and you go out and you borrow $9 million. So now you have $10 million with your, from your $1 million. You leverage up, you take on debt to buy those other assets and you can amplify the returns you're receiving. And then you pay this all back, hopefully in a Japanese yen that's depreciating in value, which is what the hope is and has this low interest rate. Mm -hmm. And that's what's been going on for many years. But what happens, and what happened three weeks ago was called a margin call. So we saw these on a, on a large scale wow. during the great financial crisis, as well as the great depression. And that's when people borrow cash in order to speculate in the financial markets. And as long as what they buy goes up, everything works out well for them. But if it goes down, the broker who lent you the cash to speculate comes to you in what's called a margin call. And they say, well, give us more cash. So in the example we gave you, you borrowed $9 million. They might say, give us a million dollars or we're going to sell all of the securities you bought with the money we borrowed, that you borrowed from us wow. to help satisfy this debt. Well, we, we saw that and we saw this, un, what we saw was an unraveling of the carry trade. And that's why we saw mm. sell-offs in stocks all around the world, bonds, uh, Bitcoin, gold, silver, mm -hmm. anything that could be exchanged for cash was sold so that those margin calls could be met. And so what, what we saw was back in early July, the Japanese yen relative to the US dollar was at an exchange rate of 100, almost 162 to the dollar, which was a 40 year high. Hmm. And at the time there was a lot of speculation that the Bank of Japan would not allow the exchange rate to breach 162 to the dollar because if that happened it was believed there was a large financial entity in japan that would receive a margin call and so hmm. based on that speculation and based on the bank of japan's posturing that they would defend the value of the yen it caused the yen to decline down to 142 in a matter of just three weeks so it at around 142 on August 5th, and that precipitous decline, you don't normally, you might see that in the stock market, but you mm -hmm. usually don't see that in the currency markets. Mm -hmm. And so that caused a lot of margin calls on people who had set up this yen carry trade. Wow. And so after that, all as you said, all of this seemed to go away 
but yeah. it has it has not gone away. They've managed to uh, paper over it for a couple of weeks now. Mm. But the <laughs> Bank of Japan is trapped, and that's why this crisis isn't going away. Wow. Well, and in your in your article, I love this article, How the Current Global Financial Crisis Leads to Biblical Tyranny in 10 Steps. This is from August 17th. Um, you say that if there's no way there is this is a no win scenario. And if, and if the listener's head is exploding, that it should be because this this is insanity. This cannot last. This is like having a fire sale. Um, you say if they raise interest rates, they will destroy the domestic economy. If they lower interest rates, they will destroy the do- domestic economy. Um and, and so your takeaway here is no matter what the Bank of Japan does, the result will be the same. They are the fourth largest economy in the world, and the destruction of the Japanese economy, um, whether deflationary or hyperinflationary, will severely weaken the entire global economy. And, I mean, I, I think we can certainly say here that what is ahead of us, regardless of this mass you know, disaster, uh, is the greatest economic and financial crisis the world has ever seen. Is that That is your conclusion on this. I have to agree with you on that. Any thoughts on that specifically? Yes. I mean, let, let, again, let's go back to August 5th. You mentioned that the Bank of Japan had raised rates the week before. Mm-hmm. Well, most people don't realize they raised the rates from 0.1%, not 1%, 0.1%, to 0.25. So it was a 0.15% okay. raise. And that's what caused all this chaos and havoc. Because they've distorted the system for so long, they've oh. the centralized planning has distorted the free market. All of this, what would have been a smaller crisis decades ago has becomes a bigger and bigger crisis each time they push this off until it can no longer be held back. Think of if you had a a beach ball and you're holding it under the water in the pool <laughs> well once it gets set free it's going to come up to the top yeah. very quickly yeah and that's that's what we're going to see here we're going to see uh this issue push itself throughout the global economy because again the bank of japan is trapped if they raise interest rates right now in order to defend the value of the yen well, then we see this yen carry trade unravel and it spreads throughout financial system. Mm-hmm. They'll crush the Japanese domestic economy. They will raise the interest on the Japanese debt to the point where the Japanese government has to default on that debt. Mm-hmm. And what are the implications of that? Oh. If they lower the rates, well, then we we see it's going to lead to hyperinflation for yeah. the average Japanese consumer. Japan mm. imports over 95% of its fossil fuels for energy. Mm. They do have nuclear power, but the lifeblood of mm. all economic activity is energy. And Japan is going to have to pay a much higher price for that if they if their currency is hyperinflating. And then there's no discretionary spending left over and the Japanese economy collapses. Again, the fourth largest economy in the world. And we've seen what's happened with the U.S. banks when interest rates have gone up and what it's done to the value of the securities on the bank balance sheets. Again, if they were to raise rates in Japan and try to try to defend the currency, they're doing the same thing to their banking system. So no matter what they do, raise rates, lower rates, even keep rates the same. One of the things we heard on August 5th was, the, was there were a lot of people on the financial news channels saying the Federal Reserve needs to have an emergency rate cut right now, 50 basis points, yeah. 75 basis points. Yeah. They don't realize had they done that. Because, and, and the reason they're saying that is because in the past that's worked. But had they done that, it would have made the situation worse because that Japanese yen carry trade is built upon the difference between the interest rates in Japan and the interest rates in the United States. And as that Mm. gap closes, that trade unravels. Mm. So whether it's Japan hiking rates or the United States lowering rates, the result will be the same. Wow. And so no matter what they choose, we're at a point now where no matter what route they choose, the end point is the same. I see. Because I, I did read a lot of that on, on August the 6th, that 
the Fed should have done A, B, C, and D. And I, I don't know enough about it to, to – I think a lot of people wanted that, but your explanation is very helpful. Now, there are some other triggers uh, out there. Um, Chinese property market meltdown. Developers are, are left hanging in massive debt. Major corporate defaults. It, China is an enigma to me because they're a communist country. I expect a Marxist uh, type of socialist economy, but they're a capitalist free market economy. This this kind of messes with my head a little bit. I always thought maybe it was sort of a pattern that we were going to see around the globe in, in the very end times. Um, but they are having a property market meltdown. Um, wow, what... I did not see that coming at all. What, what can you tell us about China right now? Because they are, are they in a full-blown recession? But I know, I know things are tough there. Yes, they're, they're in a full-blown deflationary spiral, which is what we saw during the Great Depression. I believe the rest mm. of the world will follow shortly. They're mm. just ahead of the rest of the world and the, the major economies. But what that means is basically you have a, a shrinking currency supplies. So the the global monetary system is a debt-based monetary system. And that's why I called it a Ponzi scheme earlier. It de- mm-hmm. It's dependent upon ever increasing amounts of debt being taken on by individuals, companies, and governments in order to continue functioning. Because if it, if it doesn't, the moment that the, that that debt stagnates, the whole thing implodes just like a Ponzi scheme. If you Mm -hmm. run out of new investors to put in, the whole thing falls apart. The scheme falls apart. And so we see the same thing uh, in the global monetary system. So we've all seen pictures for over a decade of these ghost cities that are built in Japan. Mm -hmm. Nobody's living in the buildings. So they used years and years of these distorted free market policies similar to what we see the Bank of Japan doing where uh, cash was used to build these cities, speculate on the property market. In Japan, the average, or, or I'm sorry, in China, the average Chinese citizen banked on their property holdings as their retirement. They buy apartments mm. and speculate on those. Mm. And as those go up in value, everything seems fine. But once they hit a point where no more debt could be taken on, then the value of those begins to drop and you start to see defaults. And in a deflationary spiral, what you see is you see bankruptcies and then those bankruptcies cause layoffs. And then the people who have been laid off are unable to meet their debt obligations, which causes further bankruptcies. Mm. That's why it's called a deflationary spiral. And it spirals down to a point where it reaches a market equilibrium, which is typically much lower than people want it to be. And so they are full blown in that deflationary spiral. Again, I would expect the rest of the world is going to follow in due time. Yeah. Well, and even Germany, which always, which is always my understanding in the modern time here, they were the number one economy in the EU. Um, and they've had four <clears throat> major, major uh, corporations, um, you know, reach insolvency in the same day. And they, every one of them is over 100 years old, BASF. Um, they're hightailing it over to China, and they were part of, of IG Farben, one of Hitler's uh, favorite companies, IG Farben cartel back in World War II, huge chemical company. Um, they go back to 1865, the beginning of the uh, chemical revolution, and uh, wow, that that surprised me quite a bit. I thought Germany was still sitting on the top of the heap. Apparently, they are not. Any thoughts on on Germany's issues? Does it have to do with affordable energy? Yes, that's that's the the key problem they face. It's following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We saw energy prices spike there, but it's not just that. They've taken mm. on a lot of these green energy policies. They've mm. dismantled nuclear power facilities that they've had. And so their energy system, we talked earlier about the lifeblood of any economy is energy. And Germany has thrived for decades on cheap energy to fuel its manufacturing capacity in the chemical industry and the automotive industry and many industries. 
And that has gone away. Even though we've seen those energy prices come down from their highs, the volatility that creates causes business leaders who are making strategic decisions to say, well, it may be, I may be profitable now, but what about six months from now, a year from now, five years mm -hmm. from now? I, I can't be sure that the energy is reliable, that it'll always be there, that it'll be there at the price I need it. Yeah. And that's why you see companies like BASF move their operations to another country where the energy supply is more reliable, less volatile in price, and that's deindustrializing the German economy. And you gave the perfect example back in September 2022 when those prices hit that peak. Those four companies, I want people to think about that, they were all over 125 years old. That means yeah. they survived World War I, post-World War I German hyperinflation, mm -hmm. the rise of Nazi Germany, World War II, and everything since. Yeah. And yet, all on the same day, they went out of business because of the energy problems in Germany. And it, is, so, this, yeah, that's, is this part of, of just the whole climate change, um, sea change we're seeing in the whole world, that you know, that people have to, governments have to jump through all these hoops and it's destroying their economies? Is that kind of at the heart of this? Or? Yes, it, that it's that and Russia's gas pipeline. So Nord oh, okay. Stream being take off taken offline the the gas natural gas storage is at high capacity levels in europe right now but they're having to get liquefied natural gas from abroad at a much higher price than they did in the past and again it's much more volatile in those energy markets so it's the combination of russia's war in ukraine and the green energy policies that are being pushed in germany going to bankrupt the whole world. But that, you know, I tend to think that's all by design anyway, and we can certainly talk about that in the second half. Uh, we are headed towards a break here pretty soon, and I want to talk about, when we come back, I want to talk about bank failures, and I want to talk about the commercial real estate debacle that no one is talking about. In 2023, there were several bank failures. I didn't, I haven't heard much about those since. Um, there was a, a run on a Silicon Valley bank, and it triggered a wider crisis. And then um, you write here in your article, within just a few months, the United States witnessed the second, third, and fourth largest bank failures in U.S. history. And Credit Suisse, also a globally systemically important bank, um, we always think they're unable to fail, but I was forced into a shotgun marriage with UBS in order to avoid failure. And uh, Britt, we were talking earlier about um, how is this held together? It doesn't make any sense. And you say the world managed to dodge a full-fledged banking crisis with contagion spreading to banks throughout the world because of a number of measures undertaken by central banks. Um, that is a whole other topic as central banks. But I want to talk about uh, bank failures here in 2024. Also, the housing market is in a bubble. It was doing so well. The stock market is overvalued. Um, just a quick question, I think, to tease uh, the next segment. Do you think that post-COVID stimulation packages kind of hurt all these scenarios as well? Yes, I think that's what blew the bubbles in okay. all of these markets. Okay. Very so, interesting. We're going to see it come crashing down. We are going to see it come crashing down, and we want to talk about CBDCs when we come back as well. So uh, we are going to take a break here. I'm talking to Britt Gillette today, brittgillette.substack.com. A lot of great articles on just about everything you can think of when it comes to prophecy. And so it's very great, a great resource um, if you're new to a lot of these things. So stay with me. We'll be back in two minutes, and we're going to talk more with Britt Gillette on global economy and all the things that are going on around that. So stay with me. Q90 FM presents the Police Lights of Christmas, helping over 70 police departments across Wisconsin. Each department is going to leave this night with a box full of thousands of dollars worth of gift cards. Visit lightsofchristmas.us. Police Lights of Christmas, a ministry of Q90 FM. Feedback, questions, and topic suggestions are always appreciated. Email us at comments at standupwithetruth.com. Welcome back to Stand Up For The Truth for August the 23rd. We're speaking with Britt Gillette this morning, brittgillette.substack.com. And we're talking about the global economy. It really is precarious, even though it's out of sight, out of mind oftentimes for us. Um, 
I think, though, as it gets ho- closer to home and we understand that there is a system coming, once this one collapses, there is a, a, a system coming that the Bible has a lot to say about. But I want to talk to Britt uh, right now at the beginning of the second half about um, bank failures. And there were some significant ones in 2023. Again, then we didn't hear about it. Britt, what is the latest on the banking system as we know it in the U.S. of A. right here halfway through 2024? Well, it's a, it's in sad shape. So as you mentioned before, last last spring in, the, or in 2023, we saw failure of the second, third, and fourth largest banks in U.S. history. And even accounting for inflation, if these failures had happened during the great financial crisis, they would have been the second, third, and fourth largest bank wow. failures in U.S. history. Wow. We avoided a major crisis at that time because the Federal Reserve created something called the Bank Term Funding Program that was a lifeline to those banks. They borrowed billions of dollars using their underwater assets as collateral. So things that were worth 50 cents on the dollar, they were able to get 100% on the dollar loan from the Federal Reserve. And that propped things up. That program ended back in March. So that's no longer there. But that according to the FDIC, the U.S. banking system, just the U.S. banking system alone is sitting on over almost half, over half a trillion dollars and unrealized losses. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Well, think of back around four years ago, people could get a 30 year mortgage at 2% or 3%. When interest rates went up and those new mortgage rates became six or 7%, those old mortgages declined in value in order to account for the new prevailing market rate of six or 7%. And so the banks took unrealized losses on those mortgages they were holding, on U.S. Treasuries they were holding that previously had yielded 1%, now they were at 5%. That's not a problem until it is, which is what we saw happen in 2023. When depositors showed up at Silicon Valley Bank and they said, we want our cash, well, they had to provide them with that cash. And one thing that I found most people do not know, which should be in big bold letters on every headline that you read, back during the COVID crisis in March 2020, the Federal Reserve changed the bank reserve requirement to 0%, meaning banks are not required to have any reserves on hand against your deposits. Wow. Therefore, when people showed up at Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic and Signature Bank and they said, give us our cash, there was no cash on hand to hand out. Instead, they had to sell things that they were holding, like these mortgages or these treasuries, at a loss. And the more they had to sell, the greater their, those unrealized losses then became realized losses and led to the failure of those banks. Wow. And so nothing has changed on bank balance sheets. In fact, it's gotten worse since then. And I think where we're ultimately heading in this is another thing that most people don't realize is after the great financial crisis, legislation was passed called Dodd-Frank. And that was put in place because people complained about all of the Wall Street bank bailouts that took place at taxpayer expense. So they said, no more bailouts. This is the last time. Mm -hmm. So the law that was put into place said, well, okay, now we'll have (laughs) bail-ins. So what is a bail-in? Well, a bail-in means if you have above the $250,000 FDIC-insured threshold of a deposit in a bank, and that bank fails... Everything above that $250,000 is used to bail in the bank, meaning it becomes, it's used to make the bank solvent again. And in exchange, you get an equity stake in that bank, which basically means you become a part owner. Hmm. But the equity you receive is going to be pennies, if not less than a penny on the dollar of what your deposits are. And so... And when Silicon Valley Bank failed, that could have been the spark that if they had bailed in, followed the law and bailed Mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley Bank, 
it would have caused a global banking crisis and run on banks because there was one company that had over a billion with a B dollars in a checking account at Silicon Valley Bank. So had 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 the government not come out and said we're going to guarantee all depositors 100%, they would have lost most entirely all of that billion dollars wow. and been out of business. Oh, wow. So it, and so it takes the I believe the president, mm-hmm. the treasury secretary and the head of the Federal Reserve to agree that a bank is a systemic risk to the economy in order to avoid that bail-in procedure, which is part of law. Wow. So at some point, and we, and we had the, the senator from Oklahoma, Senator Lankford, actually asked in the aftermath of this, well, what if a bank in my hometown fails and it's not politically connected? Are you going to bail it out? And Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, she said, well, we'll see. Right. So, wow. so the answer is no, if you're no. not if you're not yeah. politically connected at some point, they're going to uh, follow the law and one of these banks will fail mm-hmm. yeah. and it will be bailed in. And what will happen is, you know, most people hear that and they go, well, no big deal. I don't have two hundred and fifty thousand dollars plus in the bank. So this doesn't affect me. But think about your employer or your neighbor's mm-hmm. employer or your grandchild's employer, whatever it may be, Mm -hmm. that business likely has a payroll that's higher than $250,000. And most likely with one, maybe two banks, if that bank fails, then in all likelihood, that business fails. And then all the people who work at that business then lose their jobs. So at some point in the future, we're going to see them follow the law. They're going to have a bail-in I believe they'll reverse that decision probably within 24 hours because once people become aware that bail-ins are the law and that they can happen, every person, every business that has an account with more than $250,000 in it is going to be moving that cash (laughs) to Mm -hmm. most likely one of these, quote, too big to fail banks, a bank that they know is politically connected and will be bailed out. That's a systemically important bank like JP Morgan yeah. or Bank of America, Wells Fargo, whatever it may be. And just as we've seen inflation destroy the middle class, we're going to see these bank runs destroy the, the regional mm-hmm. banking system. Mm-hmm. We're going to have a handful of banks at the top with yeah. 95% of all the deposits. And there will be a few community small town banks that are left over. And that's it. There will be nothing in between. I presume that's all by design when it comes to the times that we're living in, that just to have them all merged into a couple of big institutions. And I was going to ask you if there are any that are too big to fail, but there probably are. Like you said, J.P. Morgan for sure. Um, would yeah. be one of those in my mind. You know, it's funny. I think a lot of Americans get their notion of banking from uh, It's a Wonderful Life where George Bailey, there's a run on the save, you know, Bailey building and loan and, and people are rushing over there. And, and he says he says to the elderly gal, he says, how much do you need? How much do you just need for today? And she says, seventeen <laughs> fifty. And so when they're all done, there's two dollars left to their name. And, and when they close at six o'clock, everything's fine. But uh, I think that's the way a lot of Americans think banks work. But it's not. Um, at least not in 2024. There's just way too much globalism involved here. I want to ask you about commercial real estate market because during COVID, people were working at home. They were abandoning offices, um, you know, collectively. Rising crime, property, property devaluation in the big cities, homeless camps being set up in major cities. To me, this is all kind of part of it. There's more, of course. The media is ignoring it. What is going on in the commercial real estate market? I read yesterday in D.C. alone, 50 percent of the commercial buildings are empty. Even those that are just leasing, they're still not working in these buildings. Tell us about that, because they, the loan structure of these buildings is curious to me. It's interest only loans so that they can deduct this interest. Britt, how does that work and why is this falling apart? Yes, this is a this is a big problem for many of the reasons that you just cited. These uh, the cash flow isn't there on those properties because the they're fifty percent vacant in many instances. To put in perspective just how bad this problem is, at the end of July, so less than a month ago, there was a commercial property in downtown Manhattan, prime real estate, 
that in 2006 had sold for $332 million. It went for auction July 31st for $8.5 million. So that's a 97% decline in the value of that property. Mm, Somebody wow. takes that loss. Mm -hmm. And in most every case, it's the bank that made the loan. And the reason for that is what you just stated. The, the structure of these loans is not what we would be familiar with is maybe taking out a 30-year mortgage. These are usually for a term of five years. And they are 87% of those, as you stated, are interest only loans. So, and we know, we know how that worked out during the great financial crisis. And so as we've seen declining uh, rates of, as we see the vacancy rate increase on these buildings, that means the cash flow is declining. Meanwhile, the interest rates are going back up. So when the, these loans roll over after their five year period, the bank goes to whoever took out the loan and they say, well, your new rate is going to be higher. And in, all, in most cases, the, whoever took out that loan says, you know what, we're just going to walk away from the property. You can have it. <laughs> and they, they take whatever 10 or 20 percent equity they originally mm -hmm. had put in it and they just walk away. And the bank's left holding this property. Now, you know, we talked about one in Manhattan that had declined 97% in value, that's probably an outlier, but many of these are 50 to 80% declines in value. And those, the banks are taking that hit and to see how bad the problem is, Florida Atlantic University is studying this, many of these bank issues right now. It's a great resource to go and find out what's happening is to go to Florida Atlantic University and look at their research. But they noted that if a bank ha has exposure to commercial real estate, that's 300% of its equity, what it, then it's at greater risk of failure. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that the loans they've given to commercial real estate are three, four times what the bank itself is worth. Hmm. So meaning if, <laughs> if you saw a, 25, 33% decline in the value of those or, or default on those loans, the bank would be bankrupt. Wow. And so again, 300% wow. is the ratio that regulators use to determine if a bank is at greater risk of failure. Right now, mm -hmm. according to Florida Atlantic University, 1,871 banks in the United States have commercial real estate exposure of 300% or greater. Wow. And 243 wow. of those banks are at 600%, twice as worse. Now that's all banks. Some of those banks are small. So if they fail, it's not a great risk to everyone. But uh, if you take the 155 largest banks by assets held in the United States, 62 of those banks have commercial real estate exposure greater than 300%. That's 40%. Meaning 40% of the largest banks in the United States are at greater risk of failure due to their commercial real estate exposure. Mm. And that's when we're only talking about commercial real estate. We're not talking right. about, you know, the 0% reserve requirements. And what if there's a run on the bank? We're not talking about uh, losses on their mortgage holdings and treasury holdings because interest rates went up and the value of those securities went down. So this is a really a dire circumstance. It is. It is. And nobody's really talking about it. I had heard about the building in Manhattan a couple of weeks ago. I heard about that and that really piqued my interest. Um, it just seems like they're rearranging the furniture on the Titanic. That's the only thing that comes to mind here because these little implosions here and there, I think, are going to continue to happen. Um, you're running up debt, um, bail-ins, as you talked about, um, debt hitting its limit, and and just a lot of a lot of volatility all around the world, and until it doesn't anymore, and something major happens. And I, I think I think this is a good point to insert. Uh, here, the rapture of the church, you know, um, that is going to be something that shakes the world in ways that, that we can't really 
comprehend. I don't think about it so much, but when I do think about it, I I realize that in order for people to um, claim their real estate, claim their homes, claim their bank account, this, this central ID is going to be essential. They're going to say, well, we don't know who you are. We don't know what you own or what you don't own. You can't access your bank account until we uh, figure out who you are. You're going to have to prove that to us. I think it's going to be a real world shaker. Others maybe don't agree with that. The loss of people may not be as much as we think. You know, to, to put it the way some people have put it to me, what are your thoughts on that uh, unforeseen event and what effect that will have on an incredible reset that no one is thinking about quite yet. Yes, I, I think that's absolutely true. We, the system is on such uh, shaky ground right now. I think any there, there there are any number of events that could tip it over into collapse, but the rapture of the church, I believe, would most certainly do that. Um, disappearance of millions, maybe tens or hundreds of millions of people. I don't know how many it would be, mm-hmm. but I believe it would be a significant number. And taking that <clears throat> productive capacity out of the economy, again, it's a debt-based economy where we mentioned a deflationary spiral when the company goes bankrupt and the people lose their jobs and then they can't meet their debt obligations or spend as they had in the past. Mm-hmm. And then that causes other companies to go bankrupt. I think it would just uh, facilitate that to accelerate. You mean, and we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but uh, you know, as as you were saying as well, people uh, will not be showing up to work. Uh, people's okay. homes will be sitting empty, and and so uh, everything will change. Consumer demand, um, and I think a lot is being held together in an election year. Do you have any thoughts on that? Because it looks like the economic, um, I don't know what these are promises that that one of the uh, uh, candidates is making people are screaming bloody murder that it's just Marxism through and through. Um, what are your thoughts on this upcoming election and, and how this is maybe even being glued together or duct taped together until December or January? Right. I, you know, I think that there is is some of that, but I think they've been trying to glue it and tape it together for years and years mm-hmm. because you know, many many people I talk to will say, well, the, this this is by design so that they can seize power. Well, the people running the system already have the power in the current system. What Mm. they're doing is they know the system has an end life and that it will collapse. They're going to try to extend it as long as they can. What they've been doing is making plans for the system that comes next so that they can control that too and control us to a greater degree. So the wheels were set in motion a long time ago decades ago by these central bank policies, we knew all of this would happen, that this would be the end result of it. They've been trying to push it back, whether it's bailouts during the great financial crisis or the Fed opening up the floodgates and stimulus checks with uh, the COVID crisis in 2020, whether it's the bank term funding program last year to try to stem the crisis in the banking system. They're always going to try to push back, but eventually they will no longer be able to do that. And that's why I said, I think we're there now with the Bank of Japan. And since Japan being the fourth largest economy in the world, that's not something that will be able to be ignored. That's Mm -hmm. going to all all the global, the global economy, all the nations, the world are intertwined economically. And so the collapse of an economy that that magnitude is going to have and is going to impact every person on the globe. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about this new system a little bit, because I, I've been looking into uh, cryptocurrencies since about 2016 or so. Um, and, and all the, the ledger that goes along with that. Um, CBDCs, how I know some countries in the world, not a lot, are experimenting with their own digital currency. It's fascinating because as from a technocracy standpoint, it it has a kill switch, basically based on our place in the global system, especially as believers, um, sort of like a social credit score situation that they have in in China. But what what are your thoughts on CBDC? How close are we? Biden made it sound like we were fairly close to that. Um, Even last July, he was talking about um, testing a CBDC. But what are your thoughts on where we're at with that? I think we're very close to that. The if you if you go online, the Atlantic Council has a CBDC tracker. Now, this is an organization oh. that wants the central bank digital currencies, but you can go and you can look at how this covers the globe. And 
think something hmm. like 97 percent of the world's population lives in a country that is researching or developing or has rolled out a central bank digital currency already hmm. and what this does it allows for surveillance of the population every transaction the government would have insight into that hmm. and it would also it's also programmable currency meaning so for instance when we saw the canadian trucker protest a couple of years ago and the, the canadian government told the largest banks to shut down the accounts of those involved well they won't even have to take that step they'll simply be able to flip a switch and shut those people off altogether. Or maybe they could say, your currency only works within a mile of your home, which would effectively put you under house arrest. There's all oh. sorts of things that they can do. They could determine what you're capable of buying, what you're capable of selling, where you're capable of doing all of that. But it would give the government complete surveillance. And I believe that all of this is coming on the other side of this crisis we've been talking about. And I believe people are going to demand it. And one of the reasons for that is you mentioned the uh, Bailey Brothers savings and loan. <laughs> well, people don't stand in line outside of the bank anymore when there's a bank run. Instead, they get on their phones, mm -hmm. on their computers, and they simply transfer funds from one bank to another. Hmm. And so there's no closing time where you're ringing the bell and they're running around holding up their $2 <laughs> like there was in It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> It's a 24-7 system. And sure. so the government's going to be saying, well, we need banking regulations. We need 21st century banking regulations to go with a 21st mm -hmm. century banking world. We're stuck in the past. Banking world's changed. We need the surveillance. And when people, when we look back at the great financial crisis, we had Bernie Madoff run this Ponzi scheme. And prior to that, he was this respected Wall Street guru mm -hmm. that people didn't some people suspected but not everyone suspected was running this ponzi scheme and it wiped out numerous people's lives when that came about yeah. when people realized that well something like that is probably going to happen again in this crisis and the regulators will say well if we had central bank digital currency we would know that bernie madoff didn't buy uh, stocks and bonds with the cash that his investors gave him, he bought a yacht and a house in the Hamptons. Hmm. And so they'll claim that this will help eliminate fraud. It will help them from to make sure that a crisis like this never happens again. And people, I believe, are going to demand it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Very interesting. What uh, people are told, you know, have, have your gold and silver. Those are hard assets that can't change. I tend to think the government can do whatever it wants with your gold and silver. It, you know, whoever has the weapon, whoever has the gun can, can decide all that. But I don't want people to be afraid of any of this. I know, I know that Bible prophecy, we've been studying this for many, many years. We know this is going to come. How can we encourage the church, and especially about the urgency of the gospel? Because that's the number one thing that still hasn't changed and still has to go forth no matter what world we're living in. Well, I think it definitely when we talk about massive bank failures, that causes fear in a lot in a lot mm -hmm. of people because, mm -hmm. you know, what what does that mean for my life, my yeah. ability to pay my bills, eat, right. put a roof over my head? Uh, no doubt it does that. But if you know Jesus Christ, if you if he is the Lord of your life then you've built your house on solid rock mm. and the storms of this world, no matter how bad they may be, will not destroy you. Mm -hmm. But if you're somebody out there listening who doesn't know Jesus and you've put your faith in a large bank account or a large stock portfolio or even gold and silver, then you've built, if, it's, if your faith is in anything other than Jesus Christ, then you've built your house on shifting mm -hmm. sand. And when the storm comes, you're going to be wiped out. Mm -hmm. But you can have a peace that surpasses all understanding by coming to Jesus. Why would you do that? Why is that important? Well, we're all born sinners. That just means that we've fallen short of God's mark of perfection. God is holy and we're not. Yeah. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death and the penalty is eternal separation mm -hmm. from God when we depart this world. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, and everyone will live forever. It's a matter of where and what you've done with the good news of Jesus Christ, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Britt, for being with me today. There's so much more we could have covered. We are out of time, but I appreciate your time, and I hope that we can do it again sometime. Monday, Chris Quintana, there's a replay with Chris. Tuesday is headline day, uh, so uh, stay with me next week. More to come on Stand Up For The Truth. Uh, Have a wonderful weekend in Jesus.